uh, Jamin Bowen. I am a director of product planning at Xilinx. And I'm here to talk to you about computational storage and some of the implications that that has on uh, data center architectures. Uh, so I've been working with a number of partners and customers around computational storage for a while. And I think people go through the phase of like, well, first, what is it? And then second, okay, how do I do it? And then arrive on the, okay, why? And I, I want to kind of touch base on each one of those and also uh, explain kind of where I think that we're going. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, feel free to, to raise your hand and, and ask. Uh, we'll keep this interactive. So I think it's worthwhile just at the very beginning to simplify and say why is it that people are talking about computational storage and, and what exactly it is. And this is fairly simple. So basically, in a processor-centric architecture, the compute happens on the CPU and the storage happens on the storage. Uh, what that involves is that if you want to actually process information, you have to transfer it up to the CPU, move it to the memory subsystem, and uh, then finally, if you're done with it, you want to write it back, you put it, put it back on the storage device. And basically, you have a limited amount of bandwidth, and you have high latency. And that's the fundamental motivation for moving the compute to the data. And the thing I want you to think about as we go through this is that high latency, limited bandwidth, is the overall motivation, but it's not necessarily just the physical connectivity. It's about not having to do interrupt processing. It's about not having to do context switching. That latency from the software stack is really quite a bit higher than just transferring information back and forth. So computational storage, it just kind of uh, puts, flips this on its head, and it moves some portion of the compute down to the storage, so that that can actually be processed down within the storage device itself. And there's a number of ways that you can uh, implement that, but that's a very simplistic way. It's about moving the compute to the data, re uh, eliminating the bandwidth limitation, lowering the latency, and then leaving the CPU, and this is an important part of it, leaving the CPU available for much more computationally intensive tasks. So that's the, the, uh, the first part of it. But the second part, I want to explain why, why Xilinx is talking about computational storage and why we've been involved in the uh, industry uh, working groups around this. Uh, and a big part of that, uh, I don't know if you were able to be here at the beginning, but it was nice to, to have Andy talk about how computational storage isn't really new. People have been doing it for a while. It's just a, a new... Um, industry momentum to standardize it. So today, FPGAs are used pretty heavily within storage systems. We're used as actual flash controllers, and people take advantage of our I.O. capabilities, and we're used in storage appliances as both the interconnect switching and as doing offload functions and doing compression, encryption, a lot of these uh, storage services acceleration. Um, and the reason that people have been using us to do that is that we, in, we combine this broad amount of I.O. with this hardware programmable fabric that allows you to create a function between an input and an output. So that core capability of building a custom accelerator has been what people have been using FPGAs for. Basically, you're able to have the uh, power of hardware but the reconfigurability of software. However, uh, you would have to design everything yourself. If you wanted to build an encryption accelerator, you would have to design your interfaces, you would have to design your encryption algorithm, and you'd have to design your output. Um, but you could use the same fundamental device to do something like decryption. You could reprogram it and have uh, the same fundamental device with a different hardware gate array loaded onto it, perform a, a completely different function. And then you can even, we've had people doing analytics acceleration with FPGAs as well. And that's the, the core power of the FPGA is a single device that can have multiple functions. So in many cases, it just allows you to do hardware at a much more uh, cost-effective price point and time frame than doing an ASIC or an AS, ASSP. But it's fundamentally that, that acceleration. 
so the, the reason that people look at doing an FPGA for these compute functions is you can not only have that standard piece of hardware, but you can adapt to uh, evolving architectures. So one of the things that a lot of people are looking at computational storage for is compression. And in many ways you'd think compression has already been determined, like people already have uh, hardware accelerators that can do a, uh, on an ASIC do a specific offload. But there's actually been a large amount of state of the art research in the best compression algorithms just even recently over the last few years. So kind of the gold standard is gzip, but gzip even within itself has the, um, the basic word size that you want to compress on, it has encoding schemes, it has a lot of customization that's built into that, that algorithm. But the hyperscale um, data center customers have been promoting alternative standards that they've brought out recently because they find that if you tailor the type of compression to the type of data that you're expecting, you can get a higher compression ratio and storage is expensive. If you can save 10% of, of uh, your storage and you have exabytes and exabytes of storage, the amount of savings becomes very material. And so there's been a lot of work in this space. So the nice thing about having a reprogrammable hardware subsystem is that you can have a single device and it's, it's possible to reprogram it, do an ETL transformation and use that same device to do that same type of new function and take advantage of the state of the art algorithms. Like just uh, this last year at OCP, Microsoft released uh, Zipline as their uh, compression standard. And so in this, these areas where uh, algorithms are adapting, having a reprogrammable hardware is just a, a native strength. So that, that's where people have been looking at FPGAs kind of in general. Now in the computational storage in particular, people have been looking at different ways of deploying it. And I want to, SNEA has been doing a very good job of kind of having a, a common set of terminology. And I want to go through what each of those are, a kind of partners that Xilinx is working with, and then what we see as kind of the native advantages of each deployment option. Uh, so the first one is the computational storage drive. And that is quite simply where the FPGA is embedded with the SSD directly. And this has a number of benefits. Basically, all of the computational storage systems before uh, having the computational storage movement would have to follow this approach where you would embed acceleration within the actual flash controller. So if you're trying to do something that's plug and play that is hidden from the application, this is, this is kind of your, one of the methods that you have to move forward. The other reason that people look at this is that you can have a scaling of acceleration with capacity. And that, that works out very well for uh, certain use cases. Uh, for instance, we, we have some people that are doing video transcoding uh, and they don't need that much capacity. They're looking at uploading files, doing transcoding of that file, and then pulling it out. The SSD is kind of a workspace for that operation. And in that environment, being able to add more processing at the same time as capacity is, is just very important. The second benefit out of this is that because you're further down on the storage uh, subsystem, you can have more bandwidth between the accelerator and the flash than goes upstream to the host. So you can have a by four PCIe connection and a by 16 PCIe connection internally if you want. And then the last piece of it is that if you're trying to do some optimization between the flash translation layer that's within the SSD and the acceleration, you have to be behind that interface. And so there's some native advantages that come out of this deployment model. And, and Xilinx, we're, we're broadly supporting uh, computational storage. Uh, we have partners that are bringing solutions to the market with uh, Samsung and the smart SSD that I'll go into some more detail, as well as ScaleFlux that is uh, building a solution that, you, that has computational storage available now. So that's one deployment model and the motivation for why you want to do computational storage, moving the compute to the data, reducing the amount of latency and increasing the bandwidth is kind of orthogonal to the how. So just keep that in mind. So the second one is the computational storage processor. 
And the way that this works is that you're really adding a, an accelerator on the same storage bus as, as, as storage outside of the CPU subsystem. But the media isn't attached to it directly. And so that's where this is a processor versus a drive. The main re way that this gets put together is there's direct access between the accelerator and the peer SSD devices without going through the CPU subsystem. So that's what makes it computational storage. And I'll explain a little bit more of the APIs as we go into this. So this, this has other benefits. It's basically if you want to scale your accelerators independent of your SSDs, you can do that. It, it does have the benefit of going into a, a standard uh, plug-in point for a computer. Uh, and this peer-to-peer -peer transfer is really what uh, enables it to uh, kind of glue everything together. The, uh, that, that's the way that you can avoid interrupts and have that high bandwidth and low latency. Uh, however, you do have to have a higher amount of storage bandwidth on the PCIe bus. So everything that goes into the accelerator has to go across that PCIe subsystem. So we have a number of partners that are building the solution. What, um, we have Bitware that is building uh, computational storage uh, dry, uh, processors that go into a standard U.2 slot and a Dedicom that is writing computational storage applications that, that run on top of that platform. Uh, we also, within Xilinx, we've been, uh, we've been building accelerator cards, uh, I'll show this around later, but that can actually do that same peer-to-peer -peer, uh, setup but have an add-in card uh, method that they talk to the storage subsystem. The next one is a computational storage array. And so that's, that kind of blends the, the two, where the accelerator is in line with the storage, but it's not embedded within the SSD. In many ways, this looks an awful lot like a RAID card. And in certain ways, a RAID card is a computational storage <laughs> function. It's just hidden microcode that's implementing a lot of those features. So in this case, you have a computational storage processor of some si sort that is fronting the storage. So this has the benefit where uh, you can have whatever SSD you want behind it. You can scale the accelerators and the SSDs kind of modularly. And you still are able to have that high bandwidth between uh, the accelerator, potentially much higher bandwidth to the accelerator than you have upstream to the host. And we have, uh, we have some partners. Uh, Bitware is actually making a card that, that does this uh, function that has cables that connects off to uh, uh, SSDs directly. So that's, that's kind of the how. Those are the different models, and we're, we're partnering with a lot of, part of, of companies. Uh, Xilinx uh, uh, is trying to make sure that the ecosystem grows around computational storage. Uh, but I want to at least give you one example of what you can do with computational storage and, and its power, and then go into kind of uh, what, I, what I think is new about computational storage that you should be thinking about. So as one example application that has uh, caught on relatively well, it's basically database analytics. And so as an example here, a uh, very common part of database systems is going through a large amount of data, answering a query uh, directly. So as an example here, looking at a data lake, we have a collection of flight data. Uh, and basically, this is structured. It keeps track of all of the, the flights that have taken uh, taken place, and there's a query that goes in and says, what cities originate with the most flights with greater than 10 minutes delay? And so that's a, a way that you can do a business intelligence on the efficiency of an airline. Now, the way that that gets broken down is it has to scan through this information and go in and extract just the delay part of the, in, of the, uh, the, ta the table, and then accumulate a counter for each city. And at the very end, it just gives you a ranked list. So it's a very data intensive operation uh, that, that would end up going through the CPU subsystem, causing all sorts of interrupts, blowing out the cache memory hierarchy. Uh, but you're not actually touching each piece of uh, information that much. It's a, it's a fairly simplistic compute. So by pushing this down, uh, this query processing down to a computational storage drive, uh, just one of them, you, you're able to get about uh, 4x improvement in performance for this just Spark query for just running these ad hoc analytics. Um, and that's just with a single computational storage drive versus a, a full server implementation. But the benefit of having 
uh, multiple uh, is that you get to just keep scaling performance. And so if you have four of these installed, it, it scales up to about 13 times the performance. Uh, and we have partners that are writing complete applications on computational storage platforms that abstract this completely from the end user. So all that they're doing is running Spark. It's just it pushes down parts of the query processing onto the SSD and does it behind the scenes. Uh, and that platform approach is what's kind of new, where we have people that are writing these upper level applications, interfacing with hardware without designing the hardware. And that's, that's a big part of what computational storage is enabling. And, the, and one thing I want you to think about. So I'm going to go over kind of the, the development flow that we've seen uh, that you can take advantage of to actually implement a computational storage application. And in certain ways, I think what's happening with computational storage kind of mirrors what happened in networking uh, not too long ago, where software-defined networking came out and it separated the control plane from the data plane on the network uh, network designs and allowed people to build new networking applications that wouldn't have before because they would have had to build network appliances to do that. So what computational storage is, it's doing the same thing. It's separating the control plane of hardware and functions from the data plane of hardware and functions. And uh, we'll kind of go through that. So the way that we are exposing uh, computational storage is we actually present two physical functions, and I want to explain this in a little bit more detail. We have the standard NVMe, uh, basically presentation, standard file system, and so on. And we're leveraging uh, a technique that was developed uh, by the Kronos Group, or this API called OpenCL. And OpenCL is about 10 years old at this point. And one of the benefits of taking advantage of uh, a well-defined spec is that a lot of the uh, headaches have already been worked out. The Kronos group developed the OpenCL as a way to do heterogeneous accelerators. So it's a way to have, have code that runs on GPUs, runs on FPGAs, runs on different architecture CPUs, um, all work together uh, in a kind of a standard uh, server. And so it has the ability to uh, create a, something that's called a kernel that allows you to uh, automatically copy information to, uh, it has like a queuing mechanism and, and ways to have like memory space between a host server and a separate accelerator, automatically transfer data back and forth. So all of that's been worked out and uh, it's been worked out for this ability to do heterogeneous compute. What we're doing that brings us into the computational storage is we use this heterogeneous compute physical function that's been created, this OpenCL interface, and we tie it together using that PCIe bar address register, so it has the ability to directly access uh, storage. And uh, I'll go into a kind of more specific ex example to explain how that, how that works out. But it's that PCIe bar that pulls this all together. So we talked about that database application, and I want to step through how that is actually implemented using this style of API. So basically, we, we looked at an abstract query. If you look at that in a little bit more direct SQL, you basically have a sum of some uh, tuples that is, a, is selected from some part of the data uh, and has some sort of range filter. And that's a very, very common type of application. So what you're able to do is within a computational storage platform, you can, you can break this into basically a scan, a filter, perhaps a hash join, and an aggregate. So it's really that scan, filter, aggregate that you, you can implement in uh, hardware very easily if you knew what the metadata was to say, where does this field start? Where does this field stop? What is the name for this? If you're dealing with blocks, it's very difficult to do this operation, but the base operation is easy to do in hardware. So what, the way that we're doing this is that you can separate that control plane and have the host be responsible for all of that metadata that says, here's, here's how I take an LBA to make an actual database record, and here's the fields that need to start, and so on. And that way, you can, you can build a, a hardware platform that does just that scan, filter, aggregate, 
and have all of the metadata that's required still stay in the, uh, in the host CPU. So as a quick example, this is what an application that was implementing this would look like without computational storage. Basically, and this is just pseudocode, you would go ahead and allocate memory in the host, and then you would go and query the file system. The file system would look at its metadata to say, where is this object, and go and uh, submit uh, or request the storage, and that would DMA it back into the host memory, and only then would you actually do the scan to, to actually come up with the answers, and then you'd start going through the data. By using the PCIe bar register, it's not very difficult to implement this on computational storage. If you take a look at the pseudocode, there's only, only one new line. So basically, because OpenCL already has the ability to allocate memory on an accelerator, instead of doing a malloc of host memory, you just do a uh, OpenCL command that does uh, allocation of memory on the accelerator, but that is exposed via the, via the PCIe bar address register to the NVMe device. And so that way, the, the actual output of the file system query is to the accelerator. So then the DMA is able to go directly, be queried onto the NVMe. The DMA is exactly the same as it would be before, but the output goes into this accelerator. And then the only new command is this actual run kernel and the uh, kind of event management hierarchy, that's all part of OpenCL, so it'll, it'll wait until the DMA is completed, go ahead and, and run the operation. And then finally, you just go and have this last command that just uh, returns the answer to the host CPU. And so that way, it, when you look at this, the, uh, the actual compute unit can be written and run on the uh, computational storage, but all of the uh, control flow metadata can sit in software land where it's a lot easier to manage. Uh, and that's a, a very, we think it's a very powerful way to easily take advantage of these uh, uh, compute units. And with the FPGA, these compute units can be defined kind of abstractly. You can, we, we've built kind of the interfaces that allow you to do that. Uh, and we are working with SNEA. Uh, there's a number of different ways that people are uh, implementing computational storage. We are proposing this as one of the, the models, and you can look at the computational storage working group examples and get involved in that, and, and see this, this method of using an API uh, to bring this forward. Um, I do want to just highlight again like why doing that peer-to-peer -peer makes such a difference and why uh, you can implement computational storage this way. Like really the latency comes down to eliminating interrupts, eliminating the context switches. The uh, transferring data across the PCI bus just doesn't take that long. So there's a nice um, study that was done of just using a RAM SSD on the back backside of an NVMe bus saying like how much time it took to do a polling mode to do an NVMe transfer and then how much time it would take if you did interrupts. You see in either case it, it's actually fairly high latency. If you think of the CPU side of it, with a microsecond being a thousand cycles, if you're polling, you'd, you'd uh, end up consuming a core for uh, 4,500 cycles. If you're doing interrupts, it's 6,000 cycles. It's a lot of just wasted compute. So that, that having the data transferred directly to the accelerator just makes a tremendous difference in overall performance and is a big part of, uh, of what you're unlocking. So I do want to highlight one of, uh, one of the partner solutions that is available. Uh, we've been partnering with Samsung on their smart SSD, and we implement within a single U.2 uh, a 4 terabyte VNAND plus a Xilinx FPGA, and that, that presentation of the uh, OpenCL accelerator and the NVMe physical function on the same device. Uh, this is actually available on Nimbix right now for people that want to develop applications. So if, you're, if there's something that you're interested in, you could uh, uh, get cloud access to this development environment now. Uh, but it is available for a, a variety of deployment models. We're working with some people that know how to program FPGAs and are working on writing their own acceleration kernels to plug into that API uh, and do that inside the acceleration platform. There's a number of 
of storage services that people have been developing that can just kind of be used as turnkey solutions. And then we have uh, partners that have been writing uh, and treating the computational storage as a uh, deployment vehicle for their IP that sell commercial database acceleration solutions on these. So I, I encourage you to take a look at that. That's uh, going forward. Uh, basically what has been implemented, again, is that it's off the shelf. The, uh, the interface for the host is done and you basically uh, can deploy an application directly from a partner or if you're developing it yourself and have had experience with FPGAs, there's effectively a, a 330K um, uh, LUT uh, dynamic region that allows you to put a custom kernel into that same API uh, and you can do a custom function and just write the metadata transfer uh, from the host. Uh, and like I said, this is actually available on Nimbix. So if, if you want it after, after this, you, on Nimbix, you just look for the smart SSD and apply for access and uh, I can actually do it now. All right, so I wanted to um, go to the future directions and how we, uh, we, we kind of see computational storage moving forward. So one of the, uh, the, the, the desired state that people have for data centers is, is kind of straightforward. Today, at a hyperscale data center, they deploy fixed resources with CPU, accelerators, and SSDs, and uh, if that results in suboptimal utilization and ends up in having provisioning challenges. What people really want is the ability to have arbitrary amounts of compute for a workload, arbitrary amounts of storage, and arbitrary amounts of acceleration. Like say you have something that's very, very compute heavy with just a tiny amount of data, it's kind of the opposite of computational storage. Just move the, move the data to the compute, to, the, to a dedicated accelerator tier. So what people want to do is go ahead and, and take that forward and just carve up exactly my CPU, my storage, and my acceleration. But this is all going to be Ethernet attached, ultimately. And the same problems that we're solving with computational storage of limited bandwidth and high latency is the same problem that is holding back this, this future of being able to spread architectures across it. So what we see as kind of the future is that you can actually take the same computational storage and look at implementing that on the initiator or the target side of the storage bus and you eliminate the primary thing that's holding that back. You can add acceleration to do network offload so you can do something directly off of the packet or you can move some of those compute functions out onto the storage array itself. And this has the benefits of uh, both low latency, moving compute to the data, the ethernet uh, difference from PCIe is pr quite big, and you can scale compute and storage independently. So we think that adding accelerators into each one of these pieces, into the SmartNIC side of it, and into the storage sus subsystem is potentially the answer to enabling people to have that arbitrary way uh, to carve something up. So that basically by adding some offloads, you can go ahead and set it up. And if there's something that needs to be offloaded right when it hits the NIC, you can go ahead and do that. If you need to move part of the storage function onto the host so it doesn't have to go after here, you can do acceleration within the uh, initiator. However, if it's, if it's a function that needs to have access to the data, you can move that to the storage subsystem. And then finally, if it's a very compute intensive, like some of the language translation models uh, may have a billion compute operations per sentence, <laughs> that is not something where you need to worry about moving the data to the compute. Move, uh, m excuse me, moving the compute to the data. If it's something that's that mathematically intensive, you move the data to the compute. And that, that can go forward directly. Uh, and that way, once you are able to have that balance to eliminate areas where bandwidth and latency are a concern, you can carve up systems kind of directly. Uh, so that's, that's where we see this as going. And we, we think separating that control plane of the data uh, can actually be applied to those new architectures as well. You can, you can do that similar peer-to-peer -peer setup within a sandbox on the SmartNIC. 
Uh, eventually, over time, you should be able to do that uh, NVMe over fabric out on the target as well. And so it's something just to continue thinking about. So with that, um, we see computational storage is really one of the keys to accelerating high-speed storage systems. In many ways, it's not a new thing. People have been using hardware acceleration for a long time. What's new is to standardize an API so that software developers have the ability to build solutions that take advantage of, comp of compute at the storage layer. There's huge performance increases that can come with moving the compute to data, and uh, we see Xilinx as being able to in, uh, interact with that future of that disaggregated compostable infrastructure. I appreciate your time.